funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. America's export of soybeans helps the U.S. maintain a positive agricultural trade balance. Nebraska contributes half of its soybeans for export. The protein and oil content in soybeans enhance the growing demand for higher protein diets. The Nebraska Soybean Board promotes research to develop new soybean varieties with higher protein and oil content for major agricultural markets. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Brain Olson analyzes the wheat markets. We show you how the Port of New Orleans on the Mississippi River is helping to satisfy the demand for U.S. ag goods. Dan Steinkruger explains farm program implementation under the Farm Bill Extension. And Robert Tigner will look at supply and demand in the dairy industry. As of the latest drought monitor, 77% of Nebraska remains in exceptional drought, categorized as D4 in dark red. And 96% of the state is in either extreme or exceptional drought. Nebraska by far leads the nation in D4 classification. However, there is a widespread chance of precipitation Saturday and Sunday in Nebraska, as you'll see later in Al's weather forecast. In our marketing analysis with Frayne Olson, taped Thursday morning, we started by asking how dry conditions through the center of the country hadn't completely skyrocketed wheat prices. Yeah, and that's a question I get quite often during the, the meetings, farmer meetings I have as well. And Part of the reason is that looking back, a lot of the market traders were looking at very similar conditions last year at this time where winter wheat conditions were in poor shape, we were concerned about winter kill, um, you know, the concern was how much of the winter wheat was actually going to make, make a crop and what kind of yield expectations we had. And as it turned out, we had rain showers during the summer that were about the right time. Winter wheat yields were much better than anybody really had, had it, forecasted earlier on. So the wheat market right now, even though winter wheat conditions are in worse shape now than we were last year, still has this, well, let's prove it. Let's show me that there really is a problem before we start putting a risk premium back into the marketplace. What you hear, Frayne, is, is the condition one that can be improved? Well, it is possible, and, and it depends upon what region of the, of the U.S. you're talking about. Um, when you get into the northern plains, uh, especially into South Dakota, they've had some severe problems with germination. Um, so actually some of the crop that got seeded is, is not sprouted yet. And so you know, my expectation is some of those acres get ripped up and put into other crops. But the, the key time period now, in my view, for, for the winter wheat crop is going to be as we break dormancy, and, which is starting to happen now in southern uh, Kansas and in parts of Oklahoma. What kind of rain showers precip are we going to have? Are the, is the crop going to be able to, to recover and start stooling out so we have the better yield potential? So we're getting into some pretty critical time, time periods for the for winter wheat crop. In the export market, how competitive right now is the U.S.? Yeah, part of the problem the wheat, wheat market's had the last several months is it's had this split personality or dual personality. It doesn't really know what it should do. We need to keep wheat prices high enough domestically to try and keep the wheat out of the feed channels. And of course, corn prices have been pushing wheat around for a while, in particular on the upside. But in the same time, we've been then priced out of the world market. So domestically, we need to keep the milling wheat out of the feed channels, but internationally, you know, we're priced uh, uncompetitively. As wheat prices have softened, as course, corn prices have softened a bit now, and some of our export competitors are leaving the export market, uh, some of that business is returning to the U.S. We're now very competitively priced, and we've been seeing export sales start to slowly pick up. But the, the problem has been the export sales, uh, some of the international customers have not returned very quickly. What's the international production like? If you look at you know, what came out of Australia, you go into the Black Sea region, what are those numbers like? Well, obviously the Black Sea region had some problems last year, uh, not only Ukraine, but Russia and Kazakhstan. And again, to real recognize that 
In a good year, Russia can produce as much wheat as the United States, Russia alone. And then you add its neighbors, Black Sea neighbors, you know, there's a large pool of, of wheat there um, that the world market can tap into. So the fact they had some problems last year has helped us a bit. We're getting some reports now out of Australia. Their yields are down a bit from last year. But again, recognize last year was a very good year for them. So if you look, they're about, uh, about a 10-year average. There are regions now that have some production issues. Uh, we had some rain late in the season just before harvest, so there's some quality concerns in part of their winter wheat region. But that is, uh, um, in particular for the spring wheat region, which is where I'm at, uh, that Australian crop does have a pretty impact on our export pace. Domestically framed, do you think when you look at you know, the year-end contracts going out to December, is $9 a possibility? I do think it's a possibility, but we're going to have to have a couple events. We're going to have to have some confirmed problems in the winter wheat belt in the U.S. And we're also going to have to have some concern, confirmed problems in the Black Sea region. And there are parts, the core producing region in, in Russia for their winter wheat crop is having some similar problems to what we're seeing here in the U.S. So again, as we move into this uh, March, April time period, we start to get a better read on what the crop conditions are as we break dormancy, how much winter kill there has been. Um, I think that will set the stage for potentially higher prices as we move into the summer months. News came out this week, Frank, that the Kansas City Board of Trade would end trading on hard red winter wheat uh, June 28th. What effect does that have? What impact? Well, it's, it's going to have more of an emotional impact than a, necessarily a functional impact. Um, you know, the Kansas City Board of Trade has been in existence for 100 and some plus years. Um, and what the CME group, after they bought out the uh, uh, Kansas City Board of Trade, has now decided to close open cry or the pit trading, and that'll happen sometime in June. Um, they will have a pit trade op open outcry in move to Chicago, but the, the pit in uh, Kansas City will be shut down. Now you've got to recognize when we started moving to electronic trading, whereas computer trading rather than open outcry trading, uh, a lot of the volume then shifted to the electronic market. So at the end of the day, I really don't see much change in liquidity. I don't see much trade difference in trading volumes. It's just we're moving to an electronic format now. Next week, we'll look at the hog market with Missouri Extension Ag Economist Ron Plain. As part of the Nebraska Soybean Board's See for Yourself International Marketing Program, Nebraska soybean producers recently saw how the Port of New Orleans is shipping ag goods to international buyers. Last March, we showed you how the Port of Grace Harbor on the coast of Washington received soybeans from Nebraska and delivered them across the ocean. The majority of Nebraska soybeans exit the country via the west coast, but because most farmers' commodities are priced to the east and because foreign buyers can increase the value and sustainability of Nebraska's crops, our state's producers saw how critical the Mississippi River and Port of New Orleans are to their bottom lines. If there was a year to emphasize the Mississippi River's importance, it'd be a drought year like 2012. Low water levels from months of little or no rain threatened barge traffic and billions of dollars worth of shipments along one of the country's most important waterways. Originating in north central Minnesota, the Mississippi River flows over 2,300 miles, picking up the ends of the Missouri, Ohio, and Arkansas rivers along the way. While most Nebraska soybean exports head west to Grays Harbor in Washington, this river and the Missouri on Nebraska's border both carry significance to the state's farmers. Not only you know from Omaha on down, but even the, the Mississippi River from you know St. Louis on north, and uh, we need to keep that going to keep our exports heading toward this area. The Mississippi River Basin accounts for 92 percent of the nation's agricultural exports. The port can turn trucks moving containers in less than an hour and has the advantage of being served by six major rail lines. Road and rail are helpful, but when it comes to agriculture at this port, water is king. We're trying to capitalize on all the bulk commodities that flow on the river. Over 60% of the nation's agriculture exports flow on the river, and so we're trying to capture some of that uh, ag commodities that's already moving and containerizing it. The Port of New Orleans imports over 1.5 million tons of steel each year from Japan, Brazil, Russia, and Mexico. It also brings in large quantities of natural rubber from Asia. Those incoming ships that would otherwise pay for an empty return trip through the Panama Canal have now found a fit with either 20 or 40 feet long containerized commodities. 
Though haulers on the West Coast can reach Asia in 15 days, a shipment from this Gulf can take 20 days longer. But the Port of New Orleans provides overseas buyers another location to buy U.S. goods while also benefiting from two-way trade. The ships are getting larger, the containerized ships are getting larger, so shipping lines have to fill more slots on their vessel. And because of the trade imbalance, there's a lot of empty containers that end up going back to Asia. And so having those empty containers, um, shipping lines are turning to agricultural exports to fill those empties to go back to Asia. The U.S. sends thousands of empty containers back to their original locations each year. But that may soon change. This port exported nearly 2.9 million tons of containerized cargo in 2011, over an 8 percent increase from 2010. While only a very small portion would be from Nebraska, it doesn't mean that growth in New Orleans doesn't affect the state. It still helps our commodity markets because, you know, we're based off, primarily off commodities that are east of us. And so uh, anything that would happen with the river system to either s slow it down or enhance it would, would definitely help our prices at home. With the rise of major buyers like China and major growers like Brazil, Uninterrupted U.S. transportation is arguably as important as ever. Whether the product moves by rail to the west or barge down the Mississippi, farmers in both situations share a common interest in the end user. One of the biggest things is, is just how much of our commodities move on the river and how, how very, very, very important it is even to us in Nebraska because every, every bushel that goes down that river is, is a bushel that doesn't have to come out of Nebraska to go west. We're all completely intertwined in a global market and the port in Louisiana is, is huge in that. One disadvantage the port of New Orleans might have is its proximity to the reach of New Orleans. With the city so close to the port, expansion is nearly impossible. It's a mostly linear port in New Orleans with a two mile long platform in one stretch for loading and unloading. The lack of space for development means the port must become more efficient in order to increase its numbers. In our next section of reporting, we'll show you why a large sugarcane farm in Louisiana has started to use soybeans in its crop rotation. Max McLean, a York County cattle feeder, built two new fabric-covered barns last fall to give his calves more comfort. The two steel frame buildings each hold 800 calves and are detailed in the February Nebraska farmer. McLean says the structures allowed him to expand feedlot numbers while avoiding taking cropland out of production. Plus, the, the fabric-covered barns keep cattle cooler in the summer. You can read more about the structures in the February Nebraska Farmer. Dan Steinkruger from the Nebraska State Farm Service Agency joined us earlier this week to talk about a variety of USDA topics. The agency recently announced a new microloan program. It's about to update rental rates on land for the first time in two years. And with the Farm Bill extension, it'll again be offering coverage in direct and counter-cyclical payments and the average crop revenue election program. It's really just a basic one-year extension of, of what we've had in the uh, program for several years. Um, the, uh, w with prices where they are, um, you know, we would expect the direct payments to, uh, to, to be a part of Nebraska agriculture. Put them in the savings account or the checking account and use them as you need to. And again, if you are sign up for either of the past year, you can sign up for either again, right? Th that's right. This year you have the option to either enroll directly into the ACRE program or directly in the direct and counter cyclical program. What are the trade-offs there if you sign up for ACRE in terms of the trade-offs from direct and counter cyclical? Uh, the, the enrollment in ACRE provides for a reduced direct payment and, and a lower commodity loan rate if you enroll in the commodity uh, loan. Uh, we haven't really uh, issued any of the ACRE revenue payments uh, since the 2008 Farm Bill uh, and I think the uh, the university uh, extension is going to have some information on those options. What are the sign-up dates? Uh, the sign-up starts on uh, February 19th, um, uh, and then we run through uh, June on Acre, and I believe there's an August date on uh, DCP. A couple of house cleaning things here. The SURE program from 2011, uh, there is still time to sign up, yes, in some parts of the state for disasters for that 2011 crop. Uh, yes, those, uh, those counties that had a sec secretarial disaster declaration uh, and adjacent counties are eligible for 2011 SURE. Uh, the main areas we see the, there were the flood areas along the Missouri River, uh, and then there were some areas in southwest Nebraska that had a lot of hail in 2011.
At the end of 2012, the, the dairy farmers were the ones that were probably hit with the most uncertainty with the uh, expiration of the milk program. What happens to the milk program now? The, uh, the milk program is just a straight extension also, and uh, we're going to begin to uh, issue September 2012 payments uh, in the next few days and, and the October payments probably in March. So we're, we're playing catch up on the milk program. And Farm Bill as a whole and uh, discussions in Washington as a whole, the direct payments that are currently part of this Farm Bill extension, is there any chance that those are touched or can they be touched by Washington with uh, fiscal cliff discussions here February and March? Uh, yes, uh, they are subject to, uh, to change. Uh, with appropriate action by Congress and approval of the administration. So that possibility is there. I, I think we're going to see our, uh, our congressional staff in the Senate and the House resist mm -hmm. any potential changes for those for 2013. But, but it is a possibility. Uh, a few weeks ago, the USDA announced a new microloan program for uh, beginning and smaller farmers. Uh, explain to me how you think that can benefit those producers. Well, the, the, the secretary and, and a number of groups uh, and senators and congressmen have been uh, pushing for a modification of our operating loan. So we, we rolled out the new microloan. It, it's for $35,000 or less. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's an abbreviated application and security process. Uh, and, and so it, it provides some opportunities to uh, maybe beginning farmers and some niche operations that, that might exist out there. Uh, I, I will say it is only available to those individuals that cannot get commercial credit. But uh, we, we believe it provides some new opportunity uh, and, and, a, and a streamlined process for uh, some, some operations out there. Perhaps most timely, we're into February now, so we're into the month where crop insurance will be set or crop insurance rates will be set. Uh, what do you recommend for producers or just things to keep in mind here as we go forward to that March 15th deadline? Well, lo looking at the March 15th date, it's important that, uh, that landowners, farmers, and ranchers look at their risk management uh, that they have for their operation uh, and, and visit with their crop insurance agent about their, their levels of coverage, uh, their premium costs, those types of things. Uh, you know, going into 2013, and we're, we're in a serious drought right now, uh, and, and we need to make sure that everybody's taking advantage of those programs. As far as CRP and rental rates, uh, what's new there? Well, the, the, uh, far, the Farm Bill extension provided more time for CRP at the 32 million acre uh, cap. Um, and so we anticipate that the department's going to make some announcements uh, to enroll uh, further CRP acres. Uh, part of that process is we're updating our rental rates for the first time in two years to try to reflect uh, current cash rents and market prices uh, for land. So, so we, we hope to have uh, better rates there and, and the ability for people to look at that program. Brad Lubin will be with us next week to discuss enrollment in ACRE or direct or countercyclical payments. When we last talked with Robert Tigner in October, dairy farmers were faced with uncertainty after the USDA's milk income loss contract program expired with the passing of the Farm Bill deadline. Milk price was having difficulty keeping up with high-priced feed and other expenses. We talked with Robert Tuesday about a change in the export market, continuing feed costs, and why supply may be on the rise. Well, milk production last month was up 1.7 percent. That's uh, a change from the previous couple of months we had been seeing some uh, decline in milk production. Uh, one of the, the most significant changes was that we saw more milk per cow in uh, December than we did uh, in previous months. So we're headed towards a little bit higher milk production than we had had towards the end of last year. That plays into a few things. During the summer of last year, there was a concern that uh, with the different feed sources producers were having to use that they didn't know how much milk they were going to get. But if I remember right, the supply wasn't necessarily the big concern. The big concern was the price that the consumers were going to have to pay and producers were worried about chasing consumers away. Right. There was some real concern later on last year that we were going to see much uh, higher prices. And part of that was because the expiration of the uh, of the most recent farm bill, mm. that expiration um, actually would have led to uh, old law that would have doubled milk prices and probably consumer milk prices as well. Is the producer getting enough price though? Well, if you look at the margin uh, that producers are getting, we're in the historic 
low third of margin. And for much of uh, last year, we were actually well below that. So it, it's been a real struggle to, uh, to cash flow these, uh, these dairy farms. What's the, uh, the problem behind that? Feed costs, I'm assuming, are still high? Feed costs are very high, yes, uh, compared to a few years ago, of course. Mm. But one of the other changes that's happened just recently is that milk prices have started to decline. There's uh, an expectation by traders and, and uh, the dairy industry, the processing industry, et cetera, that more milk is going to come online here in the next few months. And so the futures prices have been declining just recently. Robert, overall feed cost, uh, you know, the beef industry is facing high feed costs as well. For the dairy industry, where do they stand? Well, that's going to be a concern as well. Uh, feed costs have been increasing, and one of the reasons they've just been increasing recently is that we have uh, less and less confidence that the uh, Corn Belt drought and the Southern Plains and Central Plains drought is going to break. And unfortunately, uh, what traders are doing now is trying to uh, get ahead of that uh, lack of moisture that's appearing in the in the Corn Belt, in the Western Corn Belt, in Iowa, et cetera. And, and those feed prices are increasing due to that. That's translating into higher cost feeds for, for dairy producers and for, for any cattle producers, for that matter, livestock producers. And it's making it, it more expensive to feed dairy cows and to produce milk. And thus, uh, looking out for future uh, margin uh, for dairy producers, it's, it's declining uh, not down to the historic uh, lows that it had been recently, but it is getting uh, low uh, towards the, the low end of the scale. Let's close out in the export market. When we talked in October, it was incredibly strong. It was incredibly strong mid to late 2012. Where is it now? Well, it's flattened out uh, for 2012. The most recent data that we have um, for 2012 was in November, and it's below that uh, level that we had seen early on in the year. The export market is exceptionally good for us, however, uh, compared to previous years, but it, it, is, it is starting to weaken somewhat. In its latest dairy outlook, the USDA slightly increased cow numbers from December, therefore raising the 2013 production estimate. It lowered prices for cheese, butter, and milk due to demand. UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher says there's a strong chance of precipitation this weekend, and if you're longing for a large snowstorm, there's a possibility of that as well. Well, folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. Last week we talked about the potential for another significant storm to move into the Central Plains, and it looks like that is coming to fruition. We are expecting a widespread precipitation event across the state. Very welcome in terms of moisture because we do have many areas of the state that have really been left out high and dry for the good portion of this last fall through the winter period so far, with the vast majority of the significant moisture has been confined to east central and southeast Nebraska. During this last week, there really wasn't anything to talk about in terms of moisture, but we did see a slight warming trend last week and only to see some cooler temperatures invade northeastern Nebraska and east-central Nebraska during the early part of the week. And then that gradual warming from the west moved into the eastern Nebraska and removed that snow cover. So now, once again, we're looking at the system coming out to give us another layer of snow. And again, it's moisture and we'll take every bit we can to try to recuperate some of these excessive precipitation deficits that have been accumulating for what seems like the last year and a half. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see how this storm is going to progress as it moves through our region. And as we go to the upper air models, here's that upper air low and it is expected to swing out into the plains during this 24 hour period. We should start to see precipitation increase across the panhandle as we get into the late afternoon and that will rapidly spread across the state and there is the possibility as it spreads across the state in the evening hours that we may see a few claps of thunder across southeastern Nebraska but on the back side it's going to pull a lot of cold air in and we should start to see the snow change or rain changing over to snow as we get into the mid evening to late evening hours and then that will all spread eastward during the day on Sunday and then right now it does appear that the the worst of the weather will be across central and northeastern Nebraska but any slight deviation to the south and we could see some excessive snow amounts across a good portion of Nebraska. As we get into Sunday, you'll see the storm really starts to crank its way up to the Great Lakes and that starts to bring the cold air in and we should see the precipitation come to an end sometime late Sunday, possibly going into early Monday morning if the system slows down. 
Right now, it looks like the best area for greater than six inches of snow will be from central to northeast Nebraska, and I would not be surprised that we see some locations get over a foot of snow. As we go into Monday, We'll see the system pass into the Great Lakes and weaken, and another piece of energy is going to dive into the southern plains and swing eastward as we get into the Monday-Tuesday time frame, and the precipitation field comes right up into south-central southeast Nebraska, just to the south of us, so a little bit farther northward displacement, and we will see precipitation breaking out across the southern one to two tier counties, and that could be accumulating snowfall. Now, as we go to Wednesday, we'll see that the cold air starts to come in on the back side of this system as it strengthens as it moves toward the eastern United States, and that does mean an Arctic blast comes in to keep that snow cover in place. By the time we get to Thursday, we'll start to see some of that air modifying as that low starts to weaken toward the upper Great Lakes region, and we'll start to see a west-northwesterly flow component that'll, that'll uh, bring our temperatures up a few degrees. And then as we get to Friday, it looks like some more cold air is trying to come down the pipeline, and as we go into later into the weekend, much more significant cold air will move into the week or into the region, and that will probably carry through to the following week. So if we look at the temperature forecast, what we're going to notice is here's the rain and snow mix, pretty much the whole weekend is going to be shot for the vast majority of the folks across the state. We'll see some very cold temperatures, and then we start to see a slow, slight moderation trend in the Wednesday time frame, and then we'll see the temperatures drop off like a rock as we get into Friday. 8 to 14 day forecast indicates we're going to stay consistently cold all the way through at least the following Tuesday. And in terms of precipitation, with that cold air aloft, we're going to see several waves of Alberta clippers coming through that will give us chances for light snow off and on throughout that six to ten day forecast. Thanks Al. Our interviews with Frayne Olson, Dan Steinkruger and Robert Tigner as well as our coverage from the Port of New Orleans are archived online at the Market Journal website and our YouTube page. You can also access past segments with the Market Journal mobile app. Next week Ron Plain will be our marketing analyst, Dennis Conley will look at current ethanol margins and we'll show you why Louisiana sugarcane growers are using soybeans in their crop rotation. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.